We're very pleased to welcome Stephen Cavanaugh today and speak to the Wings Club Foundation. Stephen is the Chief Executive Officer and a member of the board at Aer Lingus. Uh, founded in 1936, Aer Lingus is the national airline of Ireland. They operate over 100 routes to the United Kingdom, continental Europe, and North America. Stephen joined Aer Lingus in 1988 and has served in a number of analytical and management roles with the firm. He joined the senior management team in March 2006, and as chief commercial officer, Stephen led the repositioning of the airline's network strategy, which transformed Aer Lingus's transatlantic business. Prior to his current appointment, Stephen served as Steve, uh, chief strategy and planning officer. So ladies and gentlemen, please, Welcome, Stephen Cavanaugh. For today's interview session, we're very pleased to have Joe Anselmo uh, back with us. Joe is Editor-in-Chief of Aviation Week and Space Technology. Uh, in 2017, Aviation Week was honored as the best business-to-business -business media brand in the Jesse H. Neal National Business Journalism Awards. Joe has covered a wide, wide uh, array of business, political, uh, military, and technology issues with Aviation Week, Congressional Quarterly, and the Washington Post. He served three terms with the National Press Club, Board of Governors, including one term as Board Chairman. Welcome, Joe. And the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Everybody back there, can you hear us okay in the back? Any problems? Okay, perfect. Stephen, welcome to New York. Thank you, Joe. Thank, thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to talk for about uh, 25 minutes, and then we will uh, open up the floor to questions from the audience. So uh, anyway, but um, Aer Lingus has a long history, I found, going back to 1936. Uh, I looked through our archives. I couldn't find anything in 1936, but what I did find was <laughs> this advertisement from 1957. It's a, actually a Collins advertisement. Um, that Aer Lingus was installing the, uh, the Collins automatic flight control system in its Fokker 27s. So we have a bigger one for you there back at the Thank table. you very <laughs> much. <laughs> it talks about the history. Um, it's not often you see leadership and Aer Lingus in the same uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, But l l let's fast forward to the present. Um, tell us a little bit about where you are now, and especially for this audience, um, your US strategy. I mean. Uh, Transatlantic to the U.S. Is, is, is a big part of your growth strategy, and I believe you just inaugurated service to Philadelphia last weekend, right? We did, uh, and we we're inaugurating Seattle in May. Uh, that will, Seattle will be our, our 13th gateway in North America. Uh, in the last uh, three, four years, uh, Aer Lingus has been the fastest growing carrier across the North Atlantic. We've uh, grown ASKs by 40% and, and improved profitability to industry leading and the highest uh, margin business within International Consolidated Airlines Group. And for those of you that aren't familiar with IAG, the parent company of British Airways, Iberia and Vueling, as well as Aer Lingus. The, this is our 60th year serving and connecting uh, Ireland and, and North America. Um, but what changed in recent years is we began to look at, at, at Ireland as not a, a spoke on other uh, networks hubs, actually as a, as a hub in its own right. Uh, and with that ambition and the ability to use the geography of, of uh, Ireland to connect not just Ireland and North America because we have a, a rich heritage and lineage and connections with North America, but increasingly we can uh, fulfill guests' desires to travel conveniently uh, and competitively between Europe and North America using Dublin as a, as a gateway. That's powered our business. Uh, it's proved to be very successful. We've leveraged the growth opportunity to fundamentally restructure the competitiveness of our business. Uh, we have what we describe as a virtuous circle in play. We have dedicated a lot of management resource to reducing unit cost. With that unit cost, we, that has enabled growth, and we've reinvested that cost in price reductions. Now, so as a, as a business, uh, we take some pride in the fact that we are destroying unit revenue, but we're actually building 
uh, significant margin premium because we're taking cost out fa faster. So we're in that very fortunate position in that th the market is very receptive to what we're offering. We target as a business a net promoter score somewhere between 40 and 50. Uh, we are a Skytrax four-star accredited business uh, and we describe ourselves as a value model. And value, from our terms, is in the, in the eye of our, of our consumer, in the eye of our guests. So we have grown significantly, uh, we've grown successfully, uh, and we have an ambition to, to keep going. Okay. Um, how important is the U.S. market to that growth? You mentioned Seattle, Philadelphia. How, what, what other cities are you looking at for routes? I have a, uh, I, 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 to my shame, I use in the capital markets day a U.S. census map uh, of the self-proclaimed Irish Americans, um, and actually, it, it, it is. Uh, uh, it, I'd be very reluctant to build a business on, on self-proclaimed Irish Americans, but it is of assistance in 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 Aer Lingus's positioning in North America uh, as a brand, uh, not just because of 82 years of service, but as a brand. We have a connection with, with a lot of, of, of the Irish diaspora. Um, so it is uh, clearly uh, an opportunity uh, to, to continue to connect uh, cities, major population areas, that we know there are demand flows uh, to and from Ireland, that we know that there's, there's, there's a brand heritage and a connection. But increasingly, we're far more as a business. Uh, we want to offer not just Ireland, but gateways to the 50, 60 points in continental Europe and, uh, and uh, the UK, uh, because we believe the Dublin Gateway uh, is uh, a positive experience. The geography of Ireland, if you're flying between North America and Europe, you will overfly Ireland. From a cost perspective, that is the cheapest way of getting from A to B, is to use the shortest crossing. So we combine a very efficient short haul operation with a, uh, an efficient uh, North Atlantic operation, and suddenly uh, we have the power of a network uh, to be able to, to put on sale. Uh, and as new technology enables uh, greater emission with uh, smaller aircraft, and particularly the new narrow body, that's going to open up for us a whole new range of opportunity. Uh, and what we find is, is that the, as the network increases, actually the risk reduces. Uh, because in, in, in the past, we would have been adding single lanes into uh, a very confined network. Now we have, as I said, 13 uh, operations, uh, 13 gateways. We have 18 operations a day. Uh, so one on 18 is a far less uh, risky decision uh, than, than one on two. So we've, we've broken the back of the growth uh, story, uh, and now we're, we're attempting to leveraging it while keeping disciplined as to what matters. Uh, what matters for us is, is our net promoter score and our unit cost, because that's what keeps us relevant uh, from, from, from a market perspective. Okay. Uh, talking about some of those smaller, you know, narrow body aircraft, you're going to be introducing Airbus uh, A321LRs into your fleet uh, starting next year and in 2020. Um, how does that change the game for you, and how are you going to utilize those? It, it, uh, we introduced the venerable 757 about four years ago, and it was really a test bed. We, we had uh, traditionally been using the wide body 330 platform, and, and as I said, we were always feeding other people's hubs. Uh, we eventually redirected those 330s to start building frequency into Dublin Gateway, but there are a limited number of, of North American destinations. Uh, certainly, with the level of ambition we have, we, we didn't necessarily see an ability to grow as fast and as quickly with just a wide body platform. So we invested in the 757. Late to that party, but it's worked extremely well and it's enabled us open up new gateways, new destinations. And the next technology offers not just that same mission capability, but obviously significant cost advantage. Uh, there are a significant number of markets where we see, for example, no cargo demand. So an, a narrow body not having cargo capacity would be different too. But the aircraft will be capable of a full life flat business uh, product. It will have uh, connectivity on, on demand. It will have everything you expect from an intercontinental aircraft. Uh, and we'll be able to, to build that into our system, delivering uh, seat cost efficiency, uh, customer satisfaction. And most importantly for us is the, the, the utilization we can uh, ex extract from the, from the aircraft. So, 
the, the geography of, 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 of Ireland, we're, we're seven hours from the, from the east coast, we're uh, 10, 11 hours from the west coast. Uh, so there is opportunity with, on a daily basis to utilize those, what, those wide bodies. But the fact is we don't have anywhere to, with sufficient demand on a local level within Europe to send wide bodies. When the LOR comes across the Atlantic, arrives in Dublin, feeds the, the first wave of, of, of hub, then that aircraft can it itself go into, into Europe. So we're expecting to be able to get 18, 19, 20 hours of utilization out of the aircraft, which is something we looked uh, with envy at US carriers doing when they were serving Ireland for many years, starting in the Midwest or the, or, or, or the, uh, the West Coast and coming through uh, the, the Eastern hub and onto Ireland. Now we can replicate that. So if ever there was a technology that was designed for a business in the geography of, 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 uh, of Ireland, it was the, the narrow body and in our case, the 321 LOR. Okay, so speaking of uh, better efficiency, a more efficient aircraft, Embraer has just introduced, its, or just delivered its first new E2. Have you looked at the E2 at all for, for European routes? I, I look at them in your magazines, but I tend not to look at them anywhere else. Uh, let, let, let me put it in, in context, because everything sounds nice and easy in terms of what I've just described, but 90% but of our short haul business is competed against Ryanair. Uh, we are, have the good fortune to have been competing against Ryanair for the longest uh, of any airline in the world, 30 years, because they're based across the car park. They tried to buy you. <laughs> they tried to buy us three times. times. Okay. Um, uh, and in, in retrospect, yeah, that would have made for an interesting board meeting. Um, but the, 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 the discipline and, and, and the rigor with which Ryanair manages its business based on cost effectively precludes some levels of, of some fleet options from, from our armory. Um, so we are very much in, in uh, uh, high capacity uh, 320, 321-737-8-9 territory because that's what we need for the unit cost efficiencies. Uh, as technologies and as the E2 technologies or C-series technologies advance and obviously there is a convergence in terms of seat cost and now we're getting into the, the, the issue of the, uh, the problem of success in terms of infrastructure. So our home base in Dublin, uh, runway slot capacity is now becoming a significant issue. So not only does the larger aircraft give us um, economic cost efficiency, but increasingly uh, in terms of scarce uh, infrastructure, it's the most efficient unit for getting 174 guests off, 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 the, off a runway. So, we use a balance of, at the moment, ATORs for local regional services, but the, the workhorse in our fleet is the A320. Uh, we are not uh, averse to others franchising on our behalf and using the, 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 the regional jet technology. It's just not necessarily uh, a good fit for us at this point. Okay, gotcha. There's another airline that's gotten a lot of attention uh, for its efforts to offer low-cost transatlantic service Norwegian. Um, how much of a competitive threat is Norwegian to Aer Lingus, and, and how do you compete with those ultra-low fares they're offering? Um, from a capital markets perspective, they're not very competitive. We have a return on capital of 23%, and theirs is negative. So that's, that's uh, you, you can take your, you, where, where you want to invest your, your hard-earned earned dollar is, is, is one decision. From a guest perspective, uh, we have been growing uh, we will grow this year by 10% across the Atlantic. We grew last year by 12%. As I said, we've grown uh, cumulatively by over a million guests in the last four years. Uh, and we are very much focused on the price. Uh, price, product, and service. Uh, we are a demand-led airline. We let our, our guests, who are the experts in what they want, uh, determine uh, our product set. Uh, but we are absolutely focused on cost because for the majority of our guests, uh, price is, is, is a key component of their value proposition. Uh, we believe we offer uh, as good, if not better, uh, opportunity uh, for low-cost travel as Norwegian. We believe we've got a better model. We're more financially stable, so therefore we can acquire aircraft on better terms. That passes through to the consumer. We have uh, worked very hard in terms of building network connecting opportunities, both at Dublin and increasingly in North America. We have a long-standing and successful partnership with our friends and colleagues in JetBlue. Uh, and that allows 
both businesses to benefit from each other's networks. That's missing from a, a Norwegian offer. We fly to primary airports, not just in, in North America, but primary airports in Europe. We've been very careful in terms of where we've built our network. We have a very, very strong point of sale uh, in the US. 60% of our revenue, 60% of our guests originate in North America. That gives us a significant advantage. And it's by design, because it's a natural currency hedge for us. Uh, we have significant dollar-denominated costs. Um, so, uh, strategically, we targeted significant dollar-denominated revenues. And that allows us to compete not only with the Norwegians, but also uh, with your own uh, domestic uh, big three in North America. And lastly, in terms of the, the, the business model, we have a, we have a business cabin. We have a, a very uh, effective uh, and popular uh, premium business cabin, which allows us uh, to compete very aggressively uh, across the cabins. So we have long had, I think, what's referred to in North America as the unbundled fair proposition. Unlike some, uh, we don't just have them in the shop window uh, for show, we actually want to sell them. Because uh, we're a great believer in empowering our, our guests to purchase what they wish to. So in terms of uh, what has Norwegian brought to the marketplace that wasn't already there, uh, it's brought a competitive dynamic, but from a guest perspective, it hasn't brought too much more than what was already being delivered by Aer Lingus. Uh, and we're not, we're not static, we're, we're continuously evolving. Uh, and we believe, uh, we, ultimately we believe competition is good for all parties, for the consumer and for the businesses. But we believe there's reasons as to why uh, we will be successful and why the ambition that we, we, we have uh, can be leveraged and can be delivered upon. Okay. A lot of people in uh, aerospace are obviously closely watching Brexit. Um, I, I know they've, uh, the day of reckoning has been kicked on the road a little bit by this new agreement, but there still have to be air services agreements between the UK and, and the EU and the UK and the US. Uh, how worried are you about Brexit uh, impacting your business? Uh, I think ultimately the, the, the liberalization of air transport in Europe has been one of the key successes of the European project from, from any analysis. Uh, it's also been a key success for, for the UK and that connectivity inevitably will have to be retained and maintained. So I think ultimately there will be an agreement. Uh, it's a shame uh, that an element of, of disruption and uncertainty is going to be necessary until that agreement. And it's also a shame that uh, I think any objective analysis will probably see this as, as, as a less than zero sum game. There is going to be ultimately uh, less demand to and from Europe, less economic activity as a result of Brexit. But that, for a, for a business like Aer Lingus, creates opportunity because Ireland is, is very much an, an open economy. It's very dependent on international trade uh, for its existence. It's what we welcome. Um, the, the Irish are, are global travelers. Uh, we enjoy uh, not just being hospitable, but we enjoy visiting. We enjoy the, the, uh, the cultural mixes that one finds uh, across the globe. That's a powerful attribute. Uh, for Ireland, but it's also something that in Aer Lingus we wish to harness. We are open for business. Uh, if others choose to constrain or control, uh, then we see that as an opportunity. Uh, the, the gateway and the geography of Dublin, as I said, it's ideally located. Uh, so if we see more people choosing Ireland as a stop-off point or as a point to visit because either they're less welcome or it's more problematic to travel to other parts of Europe, then that's an opportunity, and that's something that we see uh, an opportunity to leverage and to offset a lot of the disappointments that we're all going to experience as a result of, of, of Brexit uh, over the next uh, number of years. Okay. Erlingus is now a part of IAG, and you're not only a part of it, you're the most successful part of it uh, since you were acquired. I, I believe your, your margins have gone from about 4% to 14.5%. How'd you do it? What's the secret to that uh, success? New accounting rules. Um, <laughs> uh, no, the, the, the reality is, I think, uh, when IAG, uh, what IAG recognized in, in Aer Lingus uh, as an investment proposition was what ultimately we've delivered upon. 
the, the business model, that virtuous circle and cycle that I was describing earlier, that was very much evident from those who were, were looking at us as a business. And what uh, IAG have done is, is they've taken ownership of the business, but they've supported uh, and given a, a significant level of autonomy to Orlingus to operate within a broader group, gave us access to capital that has allowed us to leverage a growth opportunity with greater momentum than we otherwise would have. And it's also assisted us in, in, uh, in cleaning up our share register. You know, having a 25% government ownership combined with a 30% Ryanair ownership uh, was quite uh, consuming of management time. In the last three years, the management and the people in Erlingus have had a, a, an ability to focus on our guests and on building our business. Uh, and that has translated into exceptional performance in non-fuel unit cost, uh, strong performance in net promoter score, and that virtuous circle has delivered um, very encouraging margins. Um, but it's, there are margins that we know are capable of being sustained. Uh, and we are given the autonomy within IAG to actually continue with a business model that is somewhat different to the traditional. We're not measuring ourselves on, on unit revenue, we're measuring ourselves on unit margin. Unit cost reduction is as relevant to us as unit revenue increase. Uh, and it's that autonomy and that flexibility within IAG to allow us to prosecute that, that, that vision has enabled us uh, to build scale, and that scale has essentially enabled uh, a lot of margin to drop straight to the bottom line. Uh, everyone in this room travels on airplanes um, as an airline passenger. British Airways is testing the use of biometric technology to board uh, airplanes. Is that something you, uh, you're interested in? Do you expect it to become commonplace at some point? We do. Uh, ultimately, uh, we see technology as enabling what we offer to become more personalized uh, and more self-service options becoming available. And to be frank, some guests simply don't want any human intervention between the curb and the, and, and, and the seat, and others want that hospitality or that, 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 that human engagement. What we're about is giving choice. What technology will do is will enable that choice, but will also enable efficiency. And ultimately, we see technology as not only reducing cost, but in improving the guest proposition. Uh, you know, and the, the pace of technological change is actually now uh, from, a, from an airline ex passenger experience perspective is now, there's more momentum than there's ever been. Uh, and and it, you know, it's something that as, as, as management teams we need to, to find the way uh, to, to harness. Uh, but I think you know, the biometric boarding is yesterday's news. The, 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 the future where one can select from mobile devices uh, all elements of the journey, where one can actually track all of those issues that, that are a concern to you, where you can make choices as to how you consume, that's where I think the, the, the real uh, opportunity exists because it's not only, as I said, increasing the market opportunity by reducing cost, but it will also have the potential to improve the guest experience and the satisfaction that everyone has in consuming airline services. So, so can you be a little more specific in, in, in 10 years, what, 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 what technology is going to change, revolutionize this business the most to change the passenger experience? Well, the, 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 so we have uh, long been proponents of, of the retail philosophy in, 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 uh, in airline um, uh, revenue management. So we, we have unbundled our fare to the nth degree. Um, so it's discretionary as to what you consume. It's not imposed, but it's discretionary. If you want just the seat, you can have just the seat, and we welcome you. Uh, we're indifferent, but we would like the opportunity to sell to you. Um, and increasingly, what technology enables us is to actually be more informed in how we attempt to sell to you. Uh, if you're traveling on business, we're not going to try and sell you holiday insurance. And it's, it's just at that gathering of information, but information that is relevant from a consumer perspective because it allows us to tailor packages that are of value. Not to exploit, but actually, we take a view that you're more likely to consume if we're offering something that you value. And that's what technology can bring to us. Now, in terms of, of the, the mundane elements of, 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 of air travel, I'm seeing, you know, I'm constantly surprised uh, at, at, at how fast technology is moving, and particularly in North America. You know, we have guests arriving in, 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 in Dublin now who are able to tell us where their bags are. 
uh, when they're reporting misconnections at, at, a, at, a, at a US hub because the technology is on the smartphone. Yeah, I'm consumed as an airline CEO by Flight Radar 24. There's not an hour of the day I can't see where everything is. You know, that information is a great enabler when, when one is traveling, for whatever reason one's traveling. And when you can see more and more of those types of op options, then the whole experience becomes, uh, as a consumer, you're more empowered. And if that technology is harnessed appropriately, it just improves the experience. And ultimately, if it improves the experience and reduces the cost, it increases the demand for the product we're attempting to sell. Okay, well, last question from me and then we'll, we'll throw it out to the audience. But um, we haven't really seen bad times in commercial aviation in a long time. You know, Boeing and Airbus used to go through cycles every seven to 11 years. They haven't seen a downturn in 13 years. Um, the airline industry had record profits last year. Um, it, it, is it really blue skies ahead or do, or do you see any turbulence that, that concerns you? No, there, there will inevitably be turbulence. We're, we, we, we are a function, we contribute to economic activity, but we also serve economic activity. So as the cycle, the global cycle, as well as, as, as local cycles uh, uh, continue, then obviously there'll be good years and bad years. What's different is I think as businesses, we're, we're becoming uh, far more focused on, on, on capital, on returns on invested capital. The conclusion we've drawn is that return on invested capital is critically dependent on how well we serve and understand our guests. So we believe what we have are sustainable businesses. They're not immune to the economic cycle, but they can respond and react to the economic cycle. And as long as capital is disciplined, and by that I mean that, that uh, capacity investment is rational, and that good businesses are rewarded by capital markets, uh, and bad businesses simply can't raise funding, I think that level of discipline from a capital markets perspective, combined with the fact that we're actually running airlines uh, in a far more sustainable uh, manner as good businesses, gives me some confidence that, that the, the black zero uh, on the 1st of January is something that we can build through the year, rather than looking, uh, as we did in the past, at significant swings, uh, which ultimately it was very damaging to all stakeholders. Yeah, when you talk about that good business, I mean, there's been a heck of a lot of consolidation in the U.S. Still has a, a ways to go in Europe, no? We still need to see more consolidation play out, in your opinion? I think, uh, I think there's more consolidation to come in, in, in Europe because I don't believe the, the efficiency of the capital markets is yet felt across Europe, and there are some, there are some very inefficient businesses still exist in Europe. We've seen uh, more failures in, in 2017 than we did in the previous decade in terms of businesses of substantial scale. Uh, but the, I've no doubt that consolidation within Europe uh, can improve not just the, the capital returns that the, the sector is capable of delivering, but ultimately I do believe it, it's capable of delivering a better uh, customer and guest experience as a result. Okay, great. Well, let's uh, turn it over to the audience now for some questions. We have one question. Hi, Stephen. Edward Russell from uh, Flight Global. Could you update us on the status of Aer Lingus potentially joining the joint business with British Airways, American, um, Iberia, and Finnair, please? Yes, we have, um, we have been negotiating in the last 18 months the terms of, of, of uh, our joining. Uh, part of the, the transaction uh, saw us essentially being obligated to, to join the joint business. Uh, and we're doing so uh, with a level of enthusiasm uh, based on the types of uh, agreements we've reached. Uh, we're in the process of uh, concluding uh, antitrust submissions uh, with authorities and we expect uh, the next 12 to 18 months to progress to, to joining the joint business. But what it, our entry uh, into the joint business had allows, has allowed us is to really retain that level of, of uh, historic cooperation with businesses and partners such as JetBlue readily identifies what we bring in terms of our value carrier proposition. Uh, and we, we, are, we are confident that the, the DNA that is evident within, within Aer Lingus uh, can be protected, can be developed, can be harnessed within the JB. And from our guest perspective, obviously getting access uh, to our partners' networks within the JB will obviously be of significant benefit. Any other questions? Okay, 
my name is Jennifer Hinton from Boeing. I'm curious what you think about transatlantic low-cost long haul. There are multiple airline within airlines being created, such as Level, June, and Eurowings. And alternatively, the full service carriers recently announced basic economy fares in the transatlantic market. So I'm curious, five or 10 years down the line, where you see that strategy for full service airlines. I think, uh, you know, I draw the analogy with, with, with uh, how low cost in, in within European short haul it has evolving and how ultimately we've seen it evolve in, in, in North America. There will undoubtedly be failures, uh, I think, uh, simply because the, the technology is, 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 uh, is appropriate, doesn't make the business model appropriate. Um, so there will be a lot of, of uh, CFOs tested in the, in the next uh, uh, short period of time. We would like to uh, present this momentum for you. We would like to present this memento to you. It says, uh, presented to Stephen Kavanaugh, in grateful appreciation uh, for your presentation at the Aviation Series of the Wings Club, New York City, March 2018.